We next have Amish tell us about causal matrix completion. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for inviting me, Raghu and Zanus. It's a pleasure to be here. So this is joint work with um, Munzer Dare, Devrat Shah, who's sitting here, and Dennis Shen, who is a longtime collaborator. I think he's at Berkeley as a postdoc with uh, Bin Yu and Peng Ding and Jas. So he's not here, but uh, this is joint work with the three of them. So when we think of matrix completion, we normally think of um, recommendation systems, especially like the Netflix problem, right? So rows are different users, columns are different movies, and there's a rating given to a particular user item combination. But most things are missing because you don't get to observe. Most people don't watch most movies, unless you're maybe a grad student like myself. I've seen a lot of movies. Uh, um, OK, so the goal of matrix completion is can you recover missing entries of a, of a matrix? Right? That's what we think about, this Netflix problem. But one thing I hope to leave you with by the end of this talk is that matrix completion is a lot more than just Netflix. Okay? The recommendation systems are part and parcel of everyday life. So rows are users, columns, are items. We have other things as well. For example, in econometrics, we a very important uh, concept is staggered adoption. Say with Medicare, where at a certain age you get Medicare, say at age 65, before which you don't, right? So you can think of this as people who did not get Medicare. So at some point you're observing their outcomes under no Medicare. At some point they hit 65, then the outcomes are missing, right? So you have this kind of staircase style pattern. Or for example, for us in ML, you can think of say contextual bandits. Here rows would be different states. Columns would be different actions, say in the finite state action case. And each entry here would be the reward for a given state in action. And so what's the goal across many of these different applications? You can think of it as imputing missing entries and denoising observed entries. Right? And the challenge when we try to think of all these problems collectively through matrix completion is that these different kinds of applications induce very different sparsity patterns. And that's really the challenge of, of thinking about this in a, in, through matrix completion. So what's the setup for matrix completion? You have some matrix M, okay? uh, that you call, we call those expected outcomes. Then you're, the, if you observe it, it's observed with some sort of noise. So Y is IIJ is going to equal to MIJ plus epsilon IJ, epsilon IJ is noise. And there's some binary mask matrix A. Okay? If AIJ is equal to one, then you observe YIJ. And if AIJ is equal to zero, then it's not observed, it's missing, question mark there. And so given Y tilde in A, your, the goal is to produce an M hat such that M hat is close to M. And there's many different ways we can define closeness. One, the, probably the most uh, standard is the Frobenius norm, which is the average across all entries. But there's more uh, stronger notions of norm. For example, the infinity norm, which is the recovery of any particular entry. <clears throat> so that's the setup for matrix completion. Now, what's the problem? Why can't we apply matrix completion as it stands to uh, those all those different applications we talked about? The problem is there's no one unified approach that works across many different sparsity patterns. So here I'm taking a quote from Ma and Chen who are at Carnegie Mellon. They wrote a really nice paper two years ago on trying to come up with the more general pattern of missingness that they allow for in matrix completion. And here's a quote from the end of their talk, uh, sorry, at the end of their paper. They say, in terms of theoretical analysis, we've not addressed the full generality of MNAR data in matrix completion, where MNAR means missing not at random. They say their theory breaks down when the probability of observation is exactly zero. For example, they would not be able to handle a case where a vegetarian will never go to a steakhouse. They say, we still assume that each entry is revealed independent of other entries. So example, we'll not be able to handle the case where if your data is missing at time t, it's also missing at time t plus one, which is true, for example, in the staggered adoption case. And they say these are just two open problems amongst many for robustly handling MNOR data with guarantees. So another problem that might show up, for example, is in the contextual bandits, the state actions which visited, i.e. the missingness pattern, is going to be confounded, i.e. correlated with the expected reward, right, for any given uh, contextual bandits mechanism, right? And these kinds of assumptions are similar to what are made by, for example, Bhattacharya and Chatterjee, Chatterjee who are at Stanford, and by Yang, Di, Yang Di, Ding, Wu, and Adele, who are at Cornell, right? Further, most of the results that exist in the matrix completion literature are generally for recovery and average over the entire matrix in the Frobenius norm. But for many of these settings, what you'd like ideally is recovery for every particular entry. Right? That's the strongest notion. Okay, so what is the talk going to be about? I'm going to provide you one way of thinking about this problem that works both empirically and theoretically across a wide variety of applications. The way I'm going to break up this talk is first, I'm going to try to motivate why we should think about missing this through an empirical example. Second, I'm going to provide you an algorithm that we propose called synthetic nearest neighbors. 
I'll talk about what it is. And then lastly, I'll end with the theoretical guarantees of synthetic nearest neighbors. So firstly, I'm trying to make a fuss about the missingness model. Does it even matter? Let's say we just use black box matrix completion algorithms that exist. If we just applied them to different sparsity patterns, how do they do? So here's a simple um, simulation to show you some of the results. So I say I give you a matrix M, just 80 by 80, it's rank is five, and a binary matrix A. So if AIJ is equal to one, then I said it's observed, otherwise it's not observed. There's no noise in the simulation. So the standard model of missingness is called missing completely at random or M car. Here, AIJ is equal to one with probability P and it's independent of everything else in the system. So for each entry of your matrix, you flip a coin with its heads with probability P, you observe it, otherwise you don't observe it. Okay, and this is the standard model of missingness that's been studied in literature by a variety of people, started by Candice and Reck and Candice and Tao in 2009 and a variety of other people have studied it. It's become a, really its own literature within statistics and ML and EE. The more recent model of missingness that people have started studying is called, at least what we call, um, limited missing not at random, called LMNAR for short. The difference is now that AIJ is going to be equal to one with probably PIJ, right? So the intensity with which you flip that coin is going to change entry by entry. Okay, so it's more flexible. And this is what I call the state of the art model of missingness. That was what I studied by Mayan Chen, by Bhattacharya and Chatterjee, Yang et al. The third model of missingness I'm going to talk through is called missing not at random. Here, the probability of observing the entry can be exactly zero. Okay. The observing one entry can affect your probability of observing another entry. And M can be correlated with A. Okay. And this is what I believe my intent called open problem in their uh, 2019 paper. Okay. So let's see. So here's a simple simulation that we all did. So in light blue here is the true distribution of M. Okay. The ratings are from one to five. This is the true distribution of those ratings in light blue. In dark blue is what you observe in the, through uh, the MCAR samples. As you'd expect, the MCAR samples and the true distribution look like each other up to a normalization, right? Because we picked them out at random. The goal of this simulation is that given the dark blue, can you recover the light blue distribution? The first method I'm gonna show you is called universal singular value thresholding. This is a very, very popular method by Saurav Chatterjee that came out in 2014. Arguably the most popular spectral filtering method. And to a surprise, it actually already stopped working well, even though it was designed for the setting. Here in dark blue is what was recovered by universal single value thresholding. It seems to just recover the mean, which is quite surprising to us. The second method we tried, and this is really, we tried a variety of different methods, such as soft compute, um, nuclear normalization, et cetera. Over all the different tests we did, soft compute is what tended to work best. And it's by Hasty et al. And here it works beautifully. Right? The dark blue that's recovered completely covers the light blue as you would hope. So at least it's covering in a distributional sense. The third method we tried is our own method called synthetic nearest neighbors, which I'll explain the algorithm in a few slides. And it's also working really well, right? The dark blue is completely covering the light blue, at least empirically. The second simulation we tried is now with LMNAR data. Okay, so now you can see that the limited missing not random data in dark blue is not a good proxy for light blue. Right, so there's bias in the way things are missing or not missing. Okay, we tried again universal single value thresholding. It performs even more poorly. It seems to just predict the mean again. And we tried alternating least, sorry, we tried uh, soft compute. And it's working decently, but not nearly as well as it was with MCAR data, right? There's a slight bias. You can see a little bit of the light blue showing up, but it's working decently. Then we tried synthetic nearest neighbors. Again, the dark blue is completely covering the light blue as you'd hope. Repeated this process again with missing not at random data. We broke the key assumptions required for the current state of the art literature to work. And so you can see now it's like this block tribal structure and USVT still doesn't work. But to our surprise, soft compute completely stops working, right? From that LMNAR setting to the MNAR setting, just switching those, killing those few assumptions, it just seems to just predict one for some strange reason. So what you see is that these methods tend to be very, very sensitive to the missingness pattern. And that's why this is, to me, a problem of causal inference, because causal inference thinks carefully about missingness. And I wouldn't show it to you if it didn't work, but synthetic nearest neighbor still obviously is, uh, is uh, recovering the, the, the distribution really well, given all three different missingness patterns. Blue area looks very different. 
Then from the top one here, yeah, you just look at the scale. So this is 140, oh. this is 1600. Oh. It just seems pretty one. Yeah, 500. Oh, oh, the scale is different because yes. of the prediction. The prediction is, is rather poor. And so this is should give you pause because MNR data is something that's present everywhere. Recommendation systems are, every, are present everywhere with movies, product, news articles, probably most importantly. But even with clinical trials where your data, where you drop out your data, you can think of that as a matrix completion problem. Or say the US census where more than 40% of the data for certain important columns is missing. And so we need to think very carefully about why your data is missing and how to, to recover uh, matrices with such missingness patterns. So now let me give you the synthetic nearest neighbor algorithm. It's really a mixture of two ideas. One is nearest neighbors. So nearest neighbors is a really simple, beautiful method. So say I want to recover in this first row, the fourth entry here. What would you do? If I, had, if I was looking for one nearest neighbor, I'd look at what other row looks like my row. Okay, there's, the second row seems to be a pretty good proxy. There are two entries here that look quite like it. So maybe I'll use that as my, my nearest neighbor. Okay, and what was the entry here that was observed four? Okay, great, I'm gonna call this four. And there's many different generalizations of this idea. What does it mean to be close? Um, how many nearest neighbors should you take to take an average? There's a bias variance rate of that happens and there's a whole literature to it, which is worth studying. Um, and it's also called collaborative filtering. Another method that we build on is called synthetic controls, which comes from econometrics. And it was developed by Alberto Abadi and his co-authors in 2003 and further analyzed by a variety of people. And the canonical example they give is asking the question of what if California never passed Proposition 99, which is the tax that was put into place to reduce uh, the amount of cigarette sales. So as a tax on, tax on tobacco. So this is what they do. They say, okay, at some point in 1990, California instituted this tax. All the other countries, uh, other states, sorry, did not institute this tax. So what we do is we're going to look at the pre-intervention outcomes of California, that is the per capita cigarette sales. Let's look at the pre-intervention outcomes of all the other states. Let's try to write the pre-intervention outcomes of California as some linear combination of the other states. The way you do this linear combination, the way you regularize your fit depends on the application. Abadi and his co-authors propose convex regression. So S is taken to be the simplex, but there's a variety of other things you could do. So you take those weights and you apply that to X2 to get your expected outcomes in the post-intervention period. So that's synthetic controls in a nutshell, and it's become an extremely popular method of to do counterfactuals in the econometrics world. And synthetic nearest neighbors is really a combination of these two ideas, so synthetic controls and nearest neighbors. I kind of like to think of it as academic Sudoku, and we'll see what I mean by that. Let's say there's some entry ij that I'd like to predict. The first step is you find this matrix X that's fully filled, such that it has a couple of properties. First, that the corresponding elements of it in row I are completely filled, so it's given by AC, it's what we call anchor, anchor columns. And the corresponding elements of it in column J are filled. It's called AR. Okay. Now, if you just look at the question mark AC, AR, and X, that looks a lot like the synthetic controls problem. That's what we're going to exploit. So now what you do is you actually break up X into K different sub matrices. How exactly do that? I'll talk about that in a second. Which each of these matrices, you learn a model between Y1 and say X1. The way we propose doing that is by principal component regression. We first do PCA on X1 to find a low rank approximation, and then apply that to your X tilde one, the beta hat that you learn, to get your first estimate. You repeat this process over the K different sub matrices you create, take the average, and that's your estimate for M hat IJ. And that's exactly the algorithm used to the simulations I just showed to you. Why PCR? How to uh, pick a K? We'll talk about that in a second. Any questions about the algorithm? Simple three step algorithm. Yeah. What's the difference between X1 and X2? So, X, I'm going to try, let's say um, K is equal to two in this sense. I'm going to take X, I'm going to break it up into two sub matrices. So, I'm just going to partition it by the, the columns. I'm going to break it up into the first half, the second half. I'm going to learn a second, separate linear model for each of those two halves. Yeah. Is the choice of uh, no, a certain assumption is required for each partition, and I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Okay. So now, why does synthetic nearest neighbor work? Simple three-step algorithm. So here are some of the assumptions that we require for this algorithm to work before I tell you the theoretical results. 
So in general, you need structure in this matrix to be able to infer anything. The most canonical structure you place is that it's lower rank. Okay. That is, there's a low dimensional latent factor for like low left single vectors and right single vectors that explain your data. So R here, which is the, which is the dimension of U and V is a lot smaller than M and N. This is called the rank of the matrix. That's the first assumption you require. And the question is what kind of missingness do we allow for? So given the low rank assumption, you can write your outcomes yij as some inner product of u and v, that's your low dimensional factors, plus epsilon ij, that's the noise. What you allow for is this kind of graphical model. That is the missingness pattern that's determined by A, I think of those are your interventions. That is, does not, epsilon, which is the noise, has no direct arrow to it. So latent factors u and v, they can point to A and y, in that sense they're correlated. But the epsilon cannot have a direct arrow to the missingness. So your missingness can only be a function of your expected rating, the expected outcome versus the noisy outcome. That's the key kind of exogeneity we allow for. And given this, the structural assumption of yij equals to the inner product of u and v plus epsilon and this exogeneity, what that leads to is that your outcomes, your y, and your missingness pattern a are independent conditional on u and v. We call this selection and latent factors. A similar idea has been studied, for example, in Calvis et al. in 18, Athey et al. in 21, and um, us as well. So given this kind of assumption, I know that we allow for, for example, the probability of observing the entry to be exactly zero. We allow the correlation between which entries you observe and which you don't observe. And M, which is given by the latent factors you expected outcomes, can be arbitrarily correlated with A. Any questions? Okay, so this is the missingness pattern that we allow for. Now, some other assumptions we make, coming back to the question of what do we require of each partition, requires what we call span inclusions. That is, the expectation of Y lies within, say, the row span of, of each of those partitions, and X tilde K lies in the column span of X to K. Okay, so this expectation of Y lying in the row span of expectation of X to K is what motivates learning a linear model. And this condition here of your X tilde K lying in the column span of expectation of X K is what we call some notion of causal transportability. That's really what allows you to transfer your model from a model from, from data that's learned in these columns to this column. The other assumption you require because you're trying to recover the mean M is that there's enough separation of signal and noise. So if you look at the smaller singular value of expectation of X1, say, that, that singular value is a lot larger than the maximum singular value of the, of the noise matrix. Okay, one way of thinking about it is that if you have, so your signals here are the first few singular values, the noise is going to be spectrally diffused. We know that by random matrix theory. And what PCR is doing is exactly is finding that low rank approximation. So it's denoising a system in that, in that sense. And that's really what motivates using PCR in this setting with, with noisy covariates. The fourth assumption we make is about the observation pattern. So what we require is that this X is large enough. We'll do meaningful learning. In particular, suppose it's of size K cubed by K square, the K cubed rows and K square columns, then X1 by XK should be divided as such. So you have K of them, each of them of size K square by K square. And so given those four assumptions, these are the type of theoretical results we can show. We can show for every pair IJ that satisfies those assumptions, you have this kind of result, this entry-wise result, which is that M hat IJ and this M IJ scales as follows. Here R is the rank of the matrix M and K is the number of syn synthetic neighbors, right? So we, div we divided our data up into K blocks, each of size K squared by K squared. K here is that parameter here. Okay, so it scales as R three over two over square root K. And I note that say in the M car case where you sample each thing with some probability P, such matrices, those big matrices X that are size K cubed by K square will exist with high probability. Okay, and the exact dependence of, yes? So you can show it's, it's, it's so for, let's say 
your probability of observing something is delta, then you can make you can show that with that with high probability this will scale as one over delta to the twelve. So you can prove so the the rate. So, but you need uh, the thing is you don't need just one big tree. You can have many of them all over the place, right? So it's not just about finding one large enough. You can, they can exist everywhere. The fact that there's one x that I'm dividing into many sub matrices is just one instance that is big enough. But all you need is like these case by case by things all over the place. And if you properly normalize your uh, estimate, so m hat minus m hat minus m you normalize it by square root k, given by a normalize it by the right um, variance proxy, then you show that you can show that this goes to a standard normal, which is what allows you to produce confidence intervals for your estimate. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Back a little bit, I'm, not, I'm not missing. So you're saying that when you write that uh, m is independent of a, you, so it's, so thinking about a single entry like M I J. And why, why is it independent? M can be arbitrarily correlated with it. But they're independent given the U and V, aren't they? The M is equal to U V transpose. I see. So okay, so that just that just holds true by the assumption that they're equal. That M is decomposable. Yeah. Another way of interpreting it is that. Your uh, missing this pattern is a function only of the low right component. And, the, and that's the part you're recovering. The remaining part we model as epsilon. Right. And so it's an expectation over the epsilon. But the missing this pattern cannot be a function of the epsilon. So when, so when does that break exactly? Like I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the sort of extreme example where this entry, the probability of observing this entry is exactly related to its actual underlying value that you don't know. Mm -hmm. So like the self-censoring kind of assumption. And so you're ruling that out by forcing the, the decomposition part. So I'm saying that, let's say, so an entry is yij that is equal to a low rank component plus noise. So it can be an arbitrary function of the low rank component, but not of the noise. So for example, if someone, if an adversary gets to see the, the outcomes, the noisy outcomes, and based on that decides which entries you're seeing and not seeing, that would not be allowed in this style of model. But if the adversary only gets to know an expectation of what's happening, and the expectation is the low-right component, that's allowed. So we can't, we can't rule out like every time the, the matrix entry is bigger than five, I'll hide it. So yeah. that'll be ruled out by what you just said. Yeah, but if the expected value is greater than five, and I show it based on that, that's okay. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, thank you. Another thing that we're thinking about is what is the most sample uh, efficient pattern for the data we looked at. And it looks like this L. So with this kind of L structure, you can recover all M times N entries at rate one over square root K, from at most M times K square plus N times K cubed entries. In particular, there's no, the M and N do not show up as a product, but as, as in an additive way, which is what you can best you can hope for. So some interesting things to think about is that maybe this has some now, uh, implications for, say, experimental design. You can think about your problem of experiment design through a matrix. Um, and it's given the fact that problems in contextual bandness can be thought of as a matrix, maybe there's some interesting implications for, say, inference versus regret balance in, in contextual bandness. And I'll just end with talking very quickly about um, variance estimation. So to produce those confidence intervals, you need to be able to estimate the, the variance of the noise. That is sigma square ij is equal to expectation of epsilon square ij, right? In general, you can't recover it, but given this, this view of matrix completion, what's one way of thinking about it? Let's say, well, let's assume that this matrix of the noise is also low rank. Let's say you wanted to make the assumption, then what happens? Okay, so observe this, that expectation of y square ij, so coordinate y squaring, what is the expectation of that? It's given by m square ij plus sigma square ij. Okay, so now let's suppose that the the rank of this matrix, okay, is uh, this S. What is its rank? Its rank is gonna be bounded by the rank of, of M squared, which we assume to be low rank. And given that we assume that sigma is low rank, then S also has to be low rank, right? So if M is low rank, the variances are low rank, 
then this matrix, the co coordinate y square is also Lorac. And that's what we're going to explain. How? So this is the algorithm. So first you apply, you do it on the matrix M that you observe, sorry, the matrix uh, Y tilde that you observe. You apply synthetic nearest neighbors on that to get M at IJ. Then you do it on the coordinate Y squaring, you apply synthetic nearest on that. What is the estimate you get from that? You get M square IJ plus sigma square IJ. You get, a, you get an estimate for that entire thing. And then you simply take the estimate you get from the second one minus the estimate you get from the first one squared. That's it. And given this, you can estimate heteroscedastic variances. And so what kind of guarantee can you provide? Suppose the error for the, the first step is given by delta one, and the error for the second synthetic nearest neighbor is given by delta two, then your coordinate wise entry recovery of the variance of sigma square ij minus sigma hat ij is bounded by the max of delta one, delta one squared plus delta two. Okay, so that's it. Now you can do coordinate wise recovery. So one interesting use case of this, say you have no missing data, you have a matrix of, of, uh, of normals okay, with the mean and a variance. And say the means are, are low rank and the variance is a low rank. And they just give you one observation from a, from a normal and they have a matrix. Given synthetic nearest neighbors, I can recover the mean and the variance of those normals given just one sample of it. Right. Okay, so now let me end very quickly. So I think there's a lot to be done between these two fields of, of uh, causal inference and matrix completion. For those of us in causal inference, we say, well, causal inference is the missing data problem. And those of us in matrix completion, we say, matrix completion is a missing data problem. And I think there's one-to-one -one mappings between many core ideas and one or the other. So for example, the goal of causal inference is to estimate potential outcomes that really amounts to imputing missing entries in your, in your matrix and different kinds of observational experimental studies that really amounts to induces different sparsity patterns in your given matrix. This notion of confounding and causal inference can be thought of as having missing, not random data. And the types of, of causal estimate, for example, the average treatment effect, individual treatment effect, et cetera, that really is amounts to recovery in different kinds of norms. So you can think of maybe the Frobenius norm as something related to like the average treatment effect and the infinity norm is somehow related to the individual treatment effect, et cetera. You can do those mappings. With that, I'd like to end. Thank you very much. I guess in a, like a kind of related question. So the, the missing data identification literature usually focuses on recovering like the joint distribution of the things that you think are observed with missingness. And your result is specifically about like this estimation error, which is usually kind of implied by, but not the same as that recovering the joint distribution. So can you comment on that relationship? But it's a good point. I, I don't know the answer to that. So in some sense, what we're doing is recovering the marginal distributions for each entry. But if you wonder a uh, um, recovery on, say, the joint distribution of all the missing this value, that's, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Thank you. Okay. If there are other questions, uh,